Moses had stage fright And David brought a rock to a sword fight And he picked twelve bad signs No one would have chosen And he changed the world The moral of the story is Everybody's got a purpose So when I hear that bell Start talking to me Saying who you think you are Cause I'm just a no everybody we're glad you're here today we've got Sherish if you remember her I know that you probably do and Damaris of course is in the house today as well so we got a couple songs picked out for her and uh, this is gonna be fun let's have some fun
Cherish is going to lead us in home. Think about just how amazing God's miracles can be, how he can move mountains. There's nothing God can't do. Nothing is impossible for God. And as we go through the chorus of this song over and over again throughout, I just want you to close your eyes and let the spirit break out in this room, and we're going to get to that one too and talk about that. Walking. 
Still in your hands. 
Amen. Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you that there is nothing that will stop you from loving us. And God, as we come together to celebrate your love for us and the relationship you desire to have for us, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit being present and moving. We thank you, God, for, for all these men and women who give of their time to sing and lead us in worship. Thank you, especially this morning for Cherish and for a moment just to be with her and allow her to be with us. God, we thank you for all that you have done. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We sure are glad you're here. And uh, I want to welcome you and say thanks for coming to join us um, and be here to worship with us. Uh, we'd love to, I'd love to know that you are here. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, text the word CONNECT to 830-224-2982. Kind of let me know you're here. That'd be cool. Or you can go to our app. I get some weird things. From okay, so, or you can go to our app, and on our app, at, if you go to the App Store or the Android Store, you can go to Lakeshore's Church, and uh, you can just hit the, word, hit the button that connects, and it lets us know you're here. That'd be awesome. Um, or if you're old, you like to write things. I was going to say old-fashioned, and then it came out old, but that's not what I meant. So, it, or you, if you like to write things down, we have little cards in uh, front of us, in front of you in the, in the seats. There's a prayer card, a connect card, and a serve card. And if there is something God is leading you to do or, or a prayer request that you'd like our prayer team to, uh, to pray, we would love for you to go ahead and fill those out and drop those along with any offering you brought today. If, that is, if God has put that on your heart in our connection um, giving boxes. They're in the back and also in the two doors as you come in um, and to celebrate uh, what God has done in and through in, in, in your life this morning. Well, I wanted to give you guys, the elders asked me to give you a quick update on Kay. Um, so the number one, there she is with Alan, Jean's brother, who gave, that is post-surgery. So um, Alan on your left is a uh, Gene's brother, and he actually gave a little over half his liver to Kay, and Kay received it, and everything seems to be working the way it's supposed to be working. Um, she's having a little problem with her tummy, um, because you can imagine. <laughs> I, I heard, and I cannot confirm this, so I don't normally do this, but I heard it was roughly 33 pounds that they removed of liver. And um, you can imagine that that is, uh, she's got to feel... <laughs> free from that. But what I want to encourage you to do is you see right underneath it where it says caringbridge.org, Kay Glazer. That is how you can get updates. Um, they, they, about every other day he, he put up an update, Gene did. And it's also a place you can send notes of encouragement directly to them. If you're not familiar, familiar with Caring Bridge, it is absolutely free. And it is a place so that rather than having to text or email or call everybody, you can get information set, sent out that goes to everyone. You have to go to carryingbridge.org first and set up a user. Um, and then you can go um, K with an E, Glazer with one S. And uh, so if you look, if you search her, it comes up. I did it this morning again, just to make sure I knew what I was doing. And um, you can go and you can find updates all the time. Good news, Alan actually got out of the hospital yesterday. So uh, he's in a recovery house, and um, they are moving that way. So I encourage you, please keep up with them. Please send them notes of encouragement. Um, they appreciate it. Um, there's a gift from us that many of you know about that is on their way there, just in case they're watching Facebook. Look for it. All right, and uh, it should be there this week. So we, are, we, are, we do ask that you continue to keep Gene, Kay, and Alan and his family in your prayers. Um, we have a couple of service opportunities coming up. We really want to encourage you as we get closer to the holidays. Uh, there are two um, big Thanksgiving meals. There's probably more than that, but these two are definitely the biggest. Um, at St. Frederick's Baptist Church, they're both the same day, November 23rd, um, that Saturday before Thanksgiving. And at Joseph's Hammer, which, or not Joseph's Hammer, wrong. I don't know why they got to use the same names. Joseph's Food Pantry which um, that's the one in Granite Shoals. So that'll be at Highland Lakes Elementary and St. Frederick's Baptist Church is here in Marble Falls and it's just right back over there. 
Um, and they will, St. Frederick's will serve about 600 meals, I know, um, to anyone. It's free. Anyone who wants, um, who would like to celebrate, it's a great opportunity. They need volunteers. And then Joseph's, I think they do like 500 to 600. So it's pretty amazing too. Um, and we have partnered with both of them over the years. So whichever one you feel God's calling you to go be a part of, hey, go be a part of it. Um, contact, there's contact information. This is also on our website. It's also <laughs> on the and all the bathrooms out front. So you can look it up or you can find it and call them. I know that St. Frederick's needs people to cook. So they cook before, whereas Joseph's uses the um, cafeteria at Highland Lakes and they cook that day. So maybe if you wanted to call and reach out, you could help both ways if you wanted to. So please be a part of that. Um, transitioning. Okay, so today is the day that churches throughout um, the world uh, celebrate and remember those that have given their life for the faith. So it's a, it's a Sunday to remember martyrdom. Um, we sometimes forget that people are still risking their lives to proclaim the name of Jesus today. It's not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. Um, and so we're going to watch a little video. It's not super intense, but there might be a little bit of intensity. So if that bothers you, you might want to take a break or if you have little kids, but it's not, like I said, it's not, I've watched it. It's not super intense, but I've been asked to always remind people because there's some that it does affect. So we're going to watch this video and then we'll come back and have communion. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. We received this calling from the Lord, that the Lord has got a purpose for us as a family, to live out our love for him, our love for the Africans, to serve, and here we are. God, take our lives and make with us whatever you find pleasant and, and good in your purpose. So it was a normal day for us, and then I just went to the office, and he was teaching that morning. Actually, that was the routine every day. And for the children, if they didn't have a weekend or didn't interact with their friends, they were doing schoolwork. Both of them have got a deep walk with the Lord and there's this hunger for the Lord that's very precious. And they are growing, they are growing in their faith day by day. And it's wonderful to be their mom and experience how they are growing. Um, and living their lives for the Lord in a place like Afghanistan. The most wonderful thing that a parent can do for his child is to bring him up in the Lord's way so that he knows who his creator is and that he can have a loving relationship with the Lord and live a life for that purpose. <laughs> I've asked myself many times in the past, Lord, is this really where you want us? Because of all the difficulties, the challenges, we can lose our lives in time for the Lord. When I look at that in the spiritual realm, I know that he will not take us to a place like Afghanistan and just dump us there and he doesn't have a plan and a purpose for that. So I know 100% that we are in the right place, that we are obedient to the calling. tell my children, um, John Pierre and today, you will face a very difficult day today um, and I'm not going to be there to help you and daddy is also not going to be there to help you but Jesus is going to be there to help you through this and he will be there 
He promised never to leave us, nor forsake us. Come on, we gotta get out of here. We have to get out of here. Take the key. Come on, Bethany. Come on, we gotta get out of here. I believe they are in front of the Lord's throne, worshipping and praising Him, glorifying Him. And that they are just waiting for me to finish the race as well. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, our words so often seem like they're not enough, but we know that you are enough. God, as part of the real, full, whole, universal body of Christ, we pray for our brothers and our sisters who are in harm's way today. We pray for those who have lost their lives, for who have lost family members, who have lost children, all in the name of our Savior Jesus. Lord, we pray by your amazing works, your almighty self, that the world comes to know who you are. God, we pray for the boldness and the strength and the courage to proclaim the name of Jesus in our lives, in our world, in our families, in our jobs. We pray, God, that we are not afraid. Lord, be with those. Be with your church, your body, and give them strength and protection. In your son's name we pray. Now that's, that's yuck, but real. So as we come into a time of communion, I want us to uh, come, if the ushers will come forward and, and hand out the bread and the juice. And if you'll take it and you'll hold it um, till we pray together. Uh, this, this passage of scripture was really laid on my heart, especially in, in uh, relation to what we remembered just then. In 2 Timothy, starting in verse 6 of chapter 1, we hear these words. And this is Paul talking to Timothy, encouraging him in the midst, probably, of some very similar tribulation. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us, doesn't make us timid, but it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join, me with, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace 
This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But now it has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. When we take communion, when we remember those who have given their life for the faith, we know it's just for a moment. God gave his son so we would have life eternal. And I love what mom said when she said, I can't wait till my race is done and I get to be with them again. But until then, I'm gonna keep fighting and running the race. And you know what? It's what we're here today to do. When we take communion, we celebrate what Jesus did for us. When he died on the cross and he took our punishment, our sins and paid for but we also celebrate the victory we have in Jesus, the victory that Jesus had over death and pain and suffering by the power of his resurrection. And those that have given their life and those that will give their life, all are celebrating with Jesus in the throne room of God. And someday we'll join them and we'll hear their stories and we'll tell them we missed them we get to hear what God did in and through them and the amazing stories of victory over death. Brothers and sisters, that is what we celebrate. We celebrate the gift that Jesus gave for us when we take communion. We celebrate the strength that we have in him. The spirit that he has given each of us that believe in him a spirit that is not afraid, a spirit filled with his power, his strength, and his discipline. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us your strength. Our hearts hurt when we watch videos. Our hearts are broken when we hear stories of our brothers and sisters giving their lives for you. But God, through the gift of your son, we know that we have ultimate victory in you. And they are with you, no longer suffering. God, challenge us to be your sons and your daughters with a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. In your son's name we pray, amen. <laughs>
When, um, hey, thanks. Yeah, 
I don't want to embarrass. Yeah, heck, I do want to embarrass him. Clint is such a gift that you guys don't know about, but he is running it all back there today, all by himself. And so I am so thankful for him. He gives, he gives so much to come here every Sunday. He lives in Austin. He comes out here just to, to serve. Um, just an amazing guy. Comes up during the week and helps us fix things and just, just we, and has a very time, I don't even know the right word, my brain's not working, but uh, his time-consuming job during the week, and he still gives of his time to come out here, so I really appreciate Clint. And all these other guys, but they know it, I tell them back there every week. But uh, when, when we first talk, started talking about Gene being gone, and started talking about who um, could come and fill, um, fill the stage and, the, and preach and lead us. The first name, without a doubt, and way ahead of all the others, was this guy. And I am so thankful that he said yes. And he's going to come back in, around a little bit before Christmas, too, and, and lead us again. Um, but we are so blessed. Uh, Damaris it was our youth minister here. Um, and he, I mean, look over there. That's all I got to say right there. That speaks for itself and um, just made an impact in this town. I, I said that. I think I said this to him. I don't know if I said it in public, but, man, I've been here forever, and I didn't, I haven't even come close to making the impact he had. He did in just a short time, and uh, Damaris is currently serving as the, I'm going to say it wrong, but the director of recruitment for their, um, for the Austin Stones um, what's it called? Mission residency program. And uh, he uh, goes all over the country recruiting people to go learn to be ministers at Austin Stone. Um, so he's, he actually told me just this morning, I didn't realize it, that this is his busiest time of year. He's on the road all week. And then he, but he, he knew and was excited to come back and speak. So Damaris is going to come and share the word with us this morning. I just want to um, tell you guys how thankful I am, and I know you are, that for Damaris and Cherish. Good morning, family. It's good to be back to see everybody. Uh, I got to get some coffee this morning and just talk and hug people, and uh, we just want to say, Cherish and I both want to say we love y'all. Uh, and we miss you guys. Um, we are we are loving being back in Taylor where we live, uh, but we miss you all. And this morning was just evidence of that um, as we got to see you all. And to all the new folks who I have not met before, hello to you. Uh, my name is Damaris Taylor, and I love to say this wherever I go, but I am a proud Greenvillian, which may mean nothing to some of you. But to me, it means everything because it means I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, in South Carolina, that's my roots, that's my home, and so I try to never forget where I came from. Uh, so this morning, uh, I'm excited to get into the Word. In fact, I'm eager to get into the Word. Uh, and so we are going to be engaging with a passage that talks about love, and specifically love that God gives us, but also the love that we should have for one another. Now, uh, in the passage, there's going to be a phrase that Christians use a lot and also non-Christians use a lot as well. And that phrase is, God is love. And we're going to talk through that and think through that a little bit this morning and process it and turn it around uh, and ask, what does that mean practically here at Lake Shores? What does that mean for God to be love and for his love to be flowing through us to one another as fellow believers. And so if you have your Bible, um, maybe you got a printed version or maybe you got a digital version, either way, turn or scroll to 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 through 12. And it's also going to be on the screen. And it reads just like this, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and 
knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. That is that phrase. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and has sent his son to be the propitiation. That's a big $10 word there for you. For our sins. We're going to talk about that more later. And then verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfect. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for yet another Sunday morning to gather to worship you. God, you are good. You are kind. You are faithful to us. And you are loving. It's mind-boggling, God, to think about how vast and deep your love is for us, your creation. And Lord, because of your love, you've blessed us with your true and incorruptible word. And as we dig into your truth this morning, reshape and mold our affections, desires, thoughts, and habits in such a way that you receive more glory from our daily living. Holy Spirit, let this message prick the hearts of each of us in just the right way so we are filled with the holy motivation to love our brothers and sisters in Christ in new and deeper ways. Jesus Remove the blockages from our ears and the scales from our eyes so that we can hear and see your word with a freshness. Spirit, do a work that only you can do. Amen. So a quick Google search. I love Google. Anybody love to Google? I just just Google stuff all the time. It's made me mentally lazy sometimes. Right, But a quick Google search of the word love will produce over 16 billion results in 0.8 seconds. That's crazy, right? And from a cursory glance at the first results page, you see images of hearts. You see a Wikipedia article on love, definitions of love from Merriam-Webster and the good old Urban Dictionary and suggested shows and movies on the topics of love from Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime. But my favorite thing on the results page is the frequently Googled questions around love. And so here are some of them. What is real love? Can you define love? What does God say about love? How does God define love? You see, I think those questions that people are Googling far and wide around the world is showing us that people are interested in what the true meaning of love is. You see, because in many people's lives, love is a befuddled and confused concept. Its true meaning is bogged down from our own messed up romantic love escapades and the fast and the flirtatious and free and fun media portrayals of love. And the true meaning of love is shackled to our sometimes broken and ruptured relationships with our families. And the true meaning of love is unfortunately lost because we love imperfectly. We're imperfect people. Therefore, our expressions of love are flawed. So it makes good sense that people are Googling what is real love because we don't know. Aside from God, we don't know. But although we love imperfectly, I'm glad about something this morning. You may have a sneaky suspicion about what I'm glad about, but I'm excited that although we love imperfectly, there is someone who loves perfectly and completely. And that one isn't stingy with his love. He, in fact, lavishes his love upon us. And if it isn't clear, I'm talking about none other than the ever-loving God. His love just continues on and on and on. 
throughout eternity for you and me. So this morning, when we look at this passage in 1 John, we're going to reflect on three observations about God's love and loving fellow followers of Christ. So let's just get right into it in verse 7 here. Verse 7 in 1 John chapter 4 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Here, the Apostle John, who also wrote the Gospel of John, and in fact, you're going to see probably some parallels between the Gospel of John and this first letter of John. He kicks off this portion of scripture with the common term of endearment. He says, beloved, and I love to say that word. It just makes me feel good inside. It's like a, a, like a fuzzy thing that happens inside. Beloved. It makes me feel deep, deeper than I am, right? And so, beloved, and it's also translated dear friends. Now, immediately following, he launches into this clear exhortation or encouragement. He says, beloved, let us love one another. Now, based on context, John is writing with the understanding that the love that he's talking about is meant to be a love that is expressed to fellow believers. And so he then writes, love is from God. So if you maybe have your phone or if you have a pen or a highlighter for your printed Bible, you might even want to underline or highlight that phrase that love is from God because it's key. You see, John, he roots the act of us as children of God, loving one another in the reality that love is from God. And this phrase brings us to our first observation, that the ultimate source of love is God. The ultimate source of love is God. Now, we'll unpack that some more in just a little bit, but I want to continue on chipping away at these various parts of these two verses. Continuing on, John writes, he says in verse 7, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Here he connects the action of love with a real intimate personal relationship with God. In other words, loving actions flow from a real relationship with God. In the first part of verse 8, John restates this claim in the negative. He says, what he said in the end of verse 7. And he says, if you don't love others, particularly your brothers and sisters in the faith, then you're not in a real or right relationship with God. That's tough. So if you aren't loving your brothers and sisters in the faith, and if you aren't loving people in general, he says that you don't know him because he is love. You see, love is a marker of truly knowing God. Finally, at the end of verse 8, John joins his claim that to love is to know God to the life-altering reality that God is love. Not that love is God, but that God is love. God in his divine being very much defines love. Not only does he define love, but he is the ultimate source of love. We see God being the source of love in his triune nature as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit love one another perfectly. And out of their abundance of triune love, they love you and they love me. And as believers in relationship with this triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have the capacity to love because God is our very source of love. Let me see if I can give you maybe a, a picture in your mind of, of how this source of love works and how, because he is the source of love, his love flows through his followers and believers and then pours out to the world. So uh, at least once a year, if not more, Cherish and I make a trip to New Orleans. And uh, yeah, go, go New Orleans, go to New Orleans. And when we go to NOLA to visit her father, we inevitably go across the mighty Mississippi River a couple of times. 
when we're going between east and west and eating some good beignets and drinking some cafe au lait at Cafe du Monde, it's, it's a good time. And when we cross over the mighty Mississippi, I can't help but look at it and think, man, this river is powerful and it's far reaching. And so when I see it, I wonder what is the source of the Mississippi? It flows through 10 states for more than 2,000 miles and what body of water could possibly supply this mighty Mississippi? You see, the head or primary source of the Mississippi River is a, a lake called Lake Itasca in northern Minnesota. And I bring this up because much like Lake Itasca, God's love is the source of our love for one another. You see, God's love, like Lake Itasca feeding the mighty Mississippi, is feeding and fueling our love for one another. And so maybe that connects in your mind like it connects for me, that he is the ultimate source of love. But let's keep moving. Let's move on to our second observation from this passage. Yes, the ultimate source of love is God. And this, this next piece gets me a little excited, so y'all might have to excuse me. But the true demonstration of love is the cross. The true demonstration of love is the cross. And where do I get that from? I get that from verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 and 10 says this. It says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this love, not that we have loved in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, here's that $10 word again, propitiation for our sins. Maybe hearing these two verses, you might be reminded of several other verses from the New Testament because it has echoes of that famous verse that we probably learned to quote in VBS or Sunday school for some of you, that John 3.16. Now, I learned it in the good old KJV. And he said it just like this. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then not only do I hear John 3.16 echoing from these verses, but I also hear Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And it reads like this. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still yet sinners Christ died for us this is good news and both of these verses help us better understand verses 9 and 10 because John 3 16 and Romans 5 8 and 1 John 4 9 through 10 each moves us towards recognizing more clearly that the truest demonstration of love is in fact the cross let's look at verse 9 and 10 more closely Verse 9 says that God's love is demonstrated for us. That's what that word manifest means, demonstrated for us through the sending of his only son. And that the sending of Jesus had a purpose. And that purpose was so that we might have life. Now, can we go back to gospel basics for a second here? I, I mean the, the very beginnings of the gospel. And it starts with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. When he says, and you were dead in your trespasses. That's me. That's you. That's right. And sins in which you once walked. But you and I, before trusting in Christ to be both our savior from sin and the Lord of our lives, we were spiritually dead. And all people who haven't trusted in Jesus are what? Spiritually dead. But God. But God, in his vast love, decided to send his only son, Jesus. Now, verse 10 further elaborates on the love we're shown and the purpose behind sending Jesus. Here comes that $10 word again. Y'all gonna have a lot of money trying to say this word. Propitiation. Everybody say it would be propitiation. There we go. Y'all said it. Man, thumbs up. A plus. Smiley face too. Right? Here propitiation and Jesus the son is sent to be that propitiation now scholars break down this word or define this word by saying that it means to be a sacrifice that bears God's wrath and turns it to favor I'm gonna say that again 
that scholars claim this word means a sacrifice that bears on one hand God's wrath and turns it to favor. When I read this, I almost lost my, my mind because I thought, man, this is amazing. And so that immediately made me think of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, when he said that for our sake, he made him, talking about Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become what the righteousness of God. You and I, before knowing Christ, we were scheduled to receive God's holy wrath. We were scheduled. It was a set thing. Scheduled to receive his holy wrath because of our sin sick selves. But Jesus, the propitiation, stepped up into our place and took on the full wrath of God on the cross, resulting in his sacrificial death. And his death not only satisfied the wrath of God, but it created an opportunity for us to be in relationship with God. You see, Jesus serving as the propitiation established what we call a great exchange. For those of us who trust in Jesus, I like that. Don't, don't pump me up, okay? You get me excited. <laughs> but Jesus serving as the propitiation established a great exchange. And for those of us who trust in Jesus by grace, through faith, our sin is taken away and we are credited what? Righteousness. This is good news. This is true love demonstrated. Now, if you can... Just humor me for a second. Let us have a little praise break moment in here because I can't seem to escape that there's this profound truth that I personally and you, we didn't deserve the love of God manifested in Jesus Christ, displayed on the old rugged cross. Yet in spite of our wicked ways, in spite of my deceitful heart, in spite of my dark thoughts, saving love was offered freely to me and lavished upon me and because of the true demonstrated love at the cross I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord this is the truth So we see at the cross that true love is demonstrated and we know from reading that God is love and that God is from love, that he's the ultimate source of love. But let's move to this last observation in verse 11. And this last observation is just saying that the real evidence of godliness is to love. The real evidence of godliness is to love. Verse 11 says, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. I'll be quick here, be brief, and skip to some application points. Because I think that, that John says it well here. He says in verse 11, he says, since God loved us, you should be greatly motivated to share the love you've received with your brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. That sacrificial love that was expressed on the cross needs to be freely distributed to fellow followers of Christ. In verse 12, John starts with the statement that no one has ever seen God. He's claiming that no one has truly experienced or seen God in all his splendid glory and majesty. Yet in the second half of verse 12, he states that if we love one another, then God dwells in us and his love is made complete in us. Now, when we look closely at the two parts of the verse together, we can claim that God is seen more fully when we love one another because of his abiding love in us. The gospel of John 13, chapter 13, verse 35 says this. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. So loving fellow believers is evidence of godliness and true relationship with God. So here comes the big question. 
So if we're supposed to love one another, how in the world do we put love into action? How do we love our brothers and sisters in the faith? And so I want to give you a, a few practical suggestions for how to love fellow followers of Christ. Before I get to my list, the first thing I want to encourage you to do is very close, very near. It's an easy one. Join a real life group. I'm going to say that again because I used to be here, right? Join a real life group. There's many of them that meet on various nights of the week, Monday through Sunday. So a real practical way to begin to love one another is to join a real life group. I also want to give you some practical suggestions from the scriptures. And so bear with me as I, I read a couple of these. One, Romans chapter 12, verse 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. If you want to know how to love one another, you need to take the time to enter into people's pain, but also enter their joy. You need to go to their kids' soccer game, cheer on their kids at the football game, but you also need to be with them when their loved one is ill. You also need to be with them at the graveside when their mother or their father passes away. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Next one, Ephesians 4, verse 2. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient. That's key. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Simply put, be patient. Simply put, make some space and some room for the brokenness of not only yourself, but each individual that you're interacting with. Then we move on to Acts chapter 2 verse 44 through 45. And it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions. This is talking about New Testament believers and belongings and distributing their proceeds to all as they had in need. Key takeaway here, be benevolent and giving to one another. Hebrews 10, verse 24 through 25. If you're not jotting this down, I would encourage you. Maybe this might be good for you. Just grab one of them. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. So encourage. Have an encouraging word. Encourage someone on their outfit. Be like, your, your, your fit is lit. Y'all know what that is? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had, I had to do that, I had to do that, I had to do that, I did that, okay. Galatians 2, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Hebrews 3, verse 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. In other words, urge your brothers and sisters to live as Christ and to battle sin. Colossians 3.9, I'm almost done. Colossians 3.9, do not lie to one another. It's easy to lie to people. It's real easy to put up a facade, to put on a mask, but do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Because you're new in Christ, stop lying. Tell the truth and get real. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So take the time to open up the word together in that real life group and teach one another. In 1 Peter 4 and 9, I got two more. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Be hospitable. I know your house not always clean, neither is mine, but invite somebody over, order a pizza, get some Thai food, I don't know, whatever you like, sit down and begin to share life. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave 
you. Simply put, practice forgiveness. Now, love is a verb. It requires actions. So this morning, to wrap up, I want to encourage you to take action here in this body of believers. Walk away with one thing today. If you walk away with one thing that you need to start here in this body of believers, loving one another, making love a priority, taking every advantage you have more than just Sunday morning, that's great, but to build together a loving community that acknowledges God as the ultimate source of love, that routinely goes back to the truth or the true demonstration of love is the cross. And then remembering that the act of loving is the real evidence of godliness. That's all I got this morning. I want to pray for you all and then dismiss us for the day. Oh, Jesus, it's so easy, Lord, to get tangled up in our schedules, to get tangled up in our own emotions, to be to ourselves, and to forget and to neglect our fellow followers of Jesus. But Lord, I pray that you would place a holy burden on each of us, that it would be a weighty burden on each of us. Lord, to continually be reaching out to one another, to be calling each other, to be texting each other, to be Facebook messaging one another, to encourage one another, to be hospitable to one another, to forgive one another for hurts. In fact, not only to forgive, but to overlook sins that may have been done to one another. Because God, we want to love as you have loved us. And so, Lord, I pray a special blessing on Lake Shores, that it would continue to grow and that its love would continue to deepen. And we pray this now in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Y'all have a great day. There was a time that I swore I would never go.